and I just had a technical glitch again. Uh, why am I not surprised that that happens sometimes in the morning? Okay, so the idea of, <laughs> like, we don't understand servanthood in America. We don't understand it. Did I lose you? Um, okay. There's Richard. He's back. We don't understand servanthood in the United States. We don't understand how this works. Uh, we, uh, we always expect, a, oh, thank you. You did a great job. Um, but that's, you know, the Lord God has his own plan for us. And so these are, these are culturally troubling verses to us, but let's read them and then we'll talk about them. Uh, Luke 17, 7, we're in ESV today. Yeah, uh, picking up verse 7, Luke 17, 7, ESV. Uh, will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what he was spoke with commanded? Uh, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, commanded say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what our, uh, was our duty. Wow. So the context of this is about forgiveness and forgiving seven times and then other places 70 times seven or whatever it is. So it's just our, our duty, our obligation to forgive. Like... You can't get all puffed up like, I forgave that guy. I'm such a superhero. It's baseline. It's what we should be doing just in the flow of our life and our day and our whatever. God, give me grace to forgive. Lord, I forgive. And then that's not, that's not how our natural inclination is, but, but it is how our supernatural inclination our agape, our love inclination should be that we should forgive. Um, so this is culturally uh, a paragraph that is troubling to Americans because we don't understand what the duty of a servant is. The duty of a servant is to serve his master. And the duty, and we think in our name and claim it culture that it is his duty to serve us. And that's not, he is God, we are not. We can't demand of God, we can ask him, we can have a loving relationship with him, but our duty is to serve him. And if you don't understand that, then you're still in beginner school. Like when, when there was a household and the, the servants had children, there they were educated in ways that they could eventually run the household when they were of age, uh, run the, all of the day-by-day -day stuff. So they trained their children to be the next generation of servant. And so, oh God, that we would train our children that way. Uh, I mean, we're in a loving relationship with the creator of the universe who chose to die for us on the cross. And all we should say is, wow, Thank you, Lord. Um, and so, uh, if we had more faith, we could be more forgiving. No, this is just mainline, baseline stuff that we should be uh, serving God in an attitude of agape and forgiveness, even though that's so, so contrary to our base nature. Sorry to mix yeah. metaphors, kind of a pun there, but we've only done what was our duty. Yeah, it's sort of, I think it's better uh, for us, easier, more easily understood as a, um, in a, a military context. Oh, there you go. Good thinking. If you have, um, you know, if you have a commanding officer give a command to one of his subordinates, uh, he doesn't say thank you necessarily when, uh, you, you wouldn't expect him to say thank you, especially if it's a, a colonel 
giving a command to a private or a corporal or something. Among officers, yeah, you might see a little bit more congeniality, but it's a command. It's not a request. It's a demand. It's a command. It is a command. It is a demand. That's right. And Jesus literally demands us that we love, that we put ourselves out there to love. And it's nice to hear the thanks when it comes, but don't count on it. Rather, realize we are unworthy servants. We are nothing more than sinners saved by grace. And we should remember that at all times rather than get puffed up about some false piety. It's the last thing you want to be. False piety. I mean, really, he's really rattled in that false piety cage. It's just like, okay, you think you're really special. You're special because you're mine. And, okay, that takes us to a whole different paragraph. And so for the last couple chapters, Luke has been telling us Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. So from the north, you could either go through Samaria or you could go around it. And if you went around it, it was more time consuming, but you didn't have to put up with those Samaritans. Okay. Sorry. A little sarcasm there. Now we're down to 11, I think. Verse 11. Yep. Luke 17, 11. ESV. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Okay. So he's up north. And as he entered the village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance, which is what they're supposed to do, and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Amen. Let's pause there. Let's pause there. So a leper is a highly communicable disease. And if you were a leper, you spent your life hanging out with only lepers because nobody else, you didn't want to infect anybody else and you were forbidden by the law. So the Jewish law protected the people from leprosy because it was contagious. You had to live outside of normal human life, which meant that lepers tended to cluster because you you do want human companionship even though uh, you're not allowed. So the commentator was talking this morning that the priesthood had medical clearance to declare somebody a leper or if they got cleansed from their leprosy to declare them clean, to declare them uh, whole. Now, um, so in the beginning of leprosy, there's certain spots and certain things that the priest would look for to declare them potentially a leper and then to declare them fully a leper if the stuff, if the, if the, the swelling and the spots didn't go away. You're a leper, stay out of everybody's way until you get healed. But, but healing didn't happen regularly for leprosy. Healing, this was a death sentence. You're going to die, and you're going to die an agonizing death, and your skin's going to fall off. Um, not, so, so there was a whole, a whole re-entry process that allowed people back into society when the Messiah healed them, or when they were healed in general. And the Messiah is the one that knew that they knew would bring healing, okay? So here we have 10 lepers gathered together. Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem, triumph and Henry and the cross. And these 10 guys stood at a distance and they voiced, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Why did they have to shout it out? Because they could not be in close proximity with quote, normal people. And that takes us down to 14. Uh, 14, yes. When he saw them, and he said to them, this is Jesus seeing them, seeing the lepers, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating picture of healing here. 
What does Jesus say? Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Does he touch them? No. Does he make mud? No. Does he speak healing to them? No. He says, go show yourself to the priest. Uh, by the way, the high priest should also know that the Messiah is in town, but on the side on that. So they, they, they went and they were cleansed. Jesus' words had such power and authority in their lives that they turned from Jesus toward the high priest and they were healed. Well, yeah, it says as they went. Yes. As they went. In other words, uh, at, the, at the sounding of the word, they probably still had symptoms showing. Yes. Nonetheless, Jesus said, go, and they went. And as they went, they were cleansed. It's, it's a powerful sentence. That, that's a leap of faith in there. That's a big leap of faith, because that would have been a death sentence if they weren't healed. And, but, but what, what empowered them for this healing is that Jesus had spoken into them. Jesus said, yeah. go show your priest. Go show the priest. And, like, they had a surge of whatever, and all of a sudden they turned, they went to the priest, and they were healed. They were cleansed. Yeah. Yeah, this is amazing. When you think about it, leprosy was a real leprosy. They called a lot of skin diseases leprosy. Yes. Uh, but uh, real leprosy was really kind of rare. Yeah. And uh, being healed of it is even more rare. Amen. But now here you've got these priests who are receiving these guys that were all declared lepers at some point and multiple healings all of a sudden from this. And this was one of those uh, those diseases, those maladies, that was supposed to be indicative uh, of the uh, work of the Messiah. Amen. Uh, like being born blind and regaining your sight, that kind of thing. It's something, it, it superseded any kind of uh, healing that they were accustomed to seeing. Uh, so the point is that the, this, here's a priest now receiving these guys uh, who are all clean, cleansed of leprosy. You'd think the guy would be saying, what's up here? I mean, it's like, this is, is there a Messiah? Is the Messiah about, or, you know, would he, would he have gone and investigated? We don't know at this point what happened, but you could imagine, too, that he spread that up the ranks. This is a, you know, among the, some of the lesser priests, but eventually it's got to get to the to the high priest. There you go. Uh, and here are multiple uh, examples of these healings going on. So uh, that the uh, the notion of the of the of the Messiah actually being among us and working. I mean, that's you know, if that doesn't get you stirred up, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing <laughs> in a religious order? That's this. You know, this is what what it's all about. Um, so anyway. Um, uh, the point is, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the whole, uh, priest hierarchy, uh, should have had a, uh, a, should have grasped the fact that, you know, this has got to, this is something that we have to investigate to see what's really going on here. And if the story and, ended there, that would be our preaching about it, but the story doesn't end there. 15. Yeah. Verse 15, then one of them, one of the, one of the nine, right? Uh, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. I'm sorry, one of the 10. Okay. This is the, the, uh, right. Uh, one of the 10 turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Interesting and picture he here. And he his face his feet, giving him thanks. There you go. So. And he was a Samaritan. One more point. Okay, there's the voice. So That's here we point. have. <laughs> The creator of the universe, the Lord Jesus, heals leprosy, which has never been done in history, or we have no record of it in history. And this guy comes back praising God and worshiping Jesus for the healing just done. Now, when the disciples did, did healing, um, they would say, rise up, we're just a man. But when Jesus does healing, he accepts the praise of this one that was healed. And uh, so often we don't give God praise for what he has done. We need to. But here he is praising God with a loud voice and falling at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks 
and he's a Samaritan. So why does the Lord Jesus heal a Samaritan? Go ahead. Well, he heals, um, we don't know exactly if they were all Samaritans or uh, if he's one of the bunch or, you know, we don't know the, the, the uh, constitution of the uh, 10 that were healed. But the point is the Samaritan who is considered really a half-bred Jew and an outcast for it uh, is the one that gives him uh, praise. Uh, you know, I, why, he, why, uh, why he was the one in particular that came back, maybe he wasn't tripped up by the uh, Jewish religion because he was a Samaritan. They believed the Bible, but they had their own uh, standards of belief. They didn't... Uh, think that uh, Jerusalem was the place to center the worship and so forth. Um, but, you know, Jesus accepted his praise uh, because of his dual nature. He, right. You know, he should, praise, he should worship only God. Yeah. And so his godly nature was certainly worthy of that praise because it was certainly that nature that healed him. So the Samaritan was on target. I mean, he was he was doing the right thing. Uh, the right way, and um, Jesus obviously did not reprimand him for receive, for giving uh, giving him praise. But now he we, did comment, verse 17, we're not ten cleansed, where are the nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Interesting. So, uh, so that kind of indicates that maybe he was the only a Samaritan out of the ten. Um, but he said to him, uh, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Okay, so now, a whole so bunch of things that we need to talk about in this one segment. So what would happen if a Samaritan went to a priest to be declared un, uh, um, not a leper anymore? Well, the priest would probably receive him because it was his duty to, to protect the community. And if somebody was not a leper anymore, the priest would probably declare him, well, uh, not sick with leprosy anymore. And probably, who knows, he might not have let him in. And he might not have actually done it in the synagogue. But somebody came to him and medically he could say, you're not sick anymore. But, so, where's the nine? So, are the nine now not healed? No, the nine are healed. The tenth one is healed. But, what does Jesus say? Rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. So, there's a whole bunch of things that happen socially, emotionally, when you are declared a leper. So he's got all of this life experience of being damaged, of having to shout, I am unclean, every time other people got near him. And now, Lord Jesus has healed his leprosy and has made him whole, has made him well. Whereas the other guys are cleansed physically, but they still have to deal with all of those perhaps decades of of emotional trauma in their life but here the Lord Jesus says rise go your way your faith has made you well no and other versions say has saved you that's right. and made you well that's right um, the uh, well the message comes to mind as one uh, version I, I, I think I did read in another as well so um, both salvation and healing amen has uh, come to by, by your faith, by the faith of the leper. That's right. Um, and, and what an amazing picture, you know, if the other guys were say, were healed but not saved, I mean, now we haven't, we, don't, we aren't yet to the cross and the resurrection, but salvation still could come to those, because we're not living in the John the Baptist era, we're living in the Lord Jesus era, and we'll talk more about the kingdom tomorrow. But, what a radical, um, un, unnatural, supernatural viewing of 
of leprosy, of healing, of hope, of a promise of eternal life. Um, uh, Mind-boggling. We, <laughs> we have just given this 20 minutes, and, it is, and, it, and if the lessons of this stick in you, then, then you can really radiate the agape of Jesus, as is your duty in servanthood. Yep. Yeah, it's a blessed duty. It's not a, not a burdensome duty. <laughs> That's uh, that should be made clear. It's, it's a command, but it's a, it's almost it's like a command to be joyful in a way. Okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Amen. Good morning, Linda. Good Amen. morning, Mike. Sorry, I didn't open the thing before. Lord, we thank you for your healing power. We thank you that you are merciful, that you are compassionate, even to those who culturally don't look like they deserve compassion. Transform us, O oh Lord, so we can be people of agape, that we can walk in love, joy, peace, and power. In Christ's name, amen. Yes. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you again. Thank you again for your the uh, instruction you've provided us, the perspective of uh, what uh, proper service uh, entails um, that um, we may uh, model ourselves upon uh, your servitude, your, your laying yourself down as a servant. And uh, it's our blessed path to follow. Yes. So we pray for your leading and your, your uh, continued direction that we might live lives that glorify you in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Blessings amen. to you all. Adios.